What's going on YouTube? Hayden here. Some of you guys might actually know me from my other channel called Crypto TV. Now this is my brand new finance channel and today I'll be covering my top five index funds that you can buy to diversify your portfolio in this 2022 recession that we might be entering. Now index funds are one of the best investment opportunities out there to make you rich because they offer something called compound interest, also known by Albert Einstein as the eighth wonder of the world. Now my plan for this recession is while the markets are still down, I plan on dollar cost averaging into these specific index funds at the lower prices because they should see a solid return when the market does decide to rebound. Not only that, by buying these at lower prices and, you know, dollar cost averaging, the dividends paid will be reinvested back in at lower prices, basically working for me as if I have my own employees. Now, I think my favorite quote about investing is not actually about timing the market itself, but actually about how much time you have in the market. And I honestly thought you guys might like that as it's really a quote to live by. Even Warren Buffett says that in his will, 10% of the cash will go in short-term government bonds and 90% in very low-cost S&P 500 index funds. Now, Warren Buffett also says you guys should be smashing the like button for the YouTube algorithm. He didn't actually say that, but this is pretty much how YouTube tracks my performance and lets me know that you guys want to see more videos like this. So definitely go ahead and give it a tap and subscribe if you haven't already. Otherwise, let's jump into today's episode. Now, index funds typically fall into different categories and you have broad market index Index funds, market cap, dividend, sector-based, even international and bonds and custom index funds. And there are a few more I didn't mention, but these are the ones you most commonly see and hear people talk about. Now, index funds are almost always a fund that follows a benchmark index, such as the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100. And index funds are almost always a great way to diversify your portfolio and think of it as a way to sample everything. Now, instead of just ordering one flavor of ice cream, an index fund actually lets you sample all the flavors so you don't have to pick and choose which one may taste good or may not taste good and they'll all come together and you'll usually have majority tasting pretty good. Now similar to mutual funds the money invested into an index fund is then used to invest in all the companies that make up the particular index which pretty much gives you a more diverse portfolio than if you were to be buying individual stocks or flavors of ice cream. Now the key difference between an index fund and mutual funds is that index funds typically offer a lower expense ratio and a lower turnover rate, which is an extremely important tool to look at when investing. And I'll explain what those mean in a minute. Now on the brokerage side of things, this is the person that actually makes the fund and index funds aren't usually actively managed, which means they have a lower fee. And it's really what sets them apart from mutual funds. Now, mutual funds, on the other hand, are typically actively managed by fund managers. And you've probably heard of, you know, Vanguard or Fidelity. Those are two companies that offer some of the best mutual funds in the space. They create them themselves. And the goal with mutual funds, unlike index funds, is to actually beat the market. And we'll talk about the best ones in a later video here on the channel. Now, let's use the S&P 500, which features 500 leading U.S. publicly traded companies as an example for index funds. Now, the S&P 500's average annualized returns since its inception in 1926 has been 10.49% every single year to date. This means that index funds pegged to the S&P 500 will typically yield the same return of 10.49%. Now, plain and simple, the goal with index funds is simply to match the market's performance, which is still incredible if you consider the average Chase savings account only offers a 0.01% APY. Think about that the next time you want to put a lot of money into the bank. But hate it. Why would I want to invest in an index fund that might yield the same return if I could just put money into the S&P 500 directly? Ah, now that's a good point. Something you need to remember about the S&P 500 is that it's just a stock market index instead of an individual stock or fund. This means you can't invest in it directly, and that's why I look for other passive investment funds that track the S&P 500's performance. Now, the main reason I have index funds in my portfolio is because of the money saved in fees. By investing in index funds over a mutual fund, you can actually save a lot of money money in the long term, and this in turn can help you make more money. Now, the first index fund that I have in my portfolio is the Fidelity Total Market Index Fund, and this index fund seeks to pretty much provide investment results that correspond to a total return of a broad range of United States stocks. 
Now, their strategy behind the fund consists of normally investing at least 80% of assets in common stocks, which are included in the Dow Jones US Total Stock Market Index. And this basically represents the performance of a broad range of US stocks. Now, typically when I look for index funds, the first thing I look for is their past performance. And I wanna make sure that this index fund performs the same, if not better than the market it is pegged to. Dave Ramsey even suggests looking at their past performance. So before committing to a fund, take a step back and consider the bigger picture. How exactly has this stock performed over the past five years? And what about the past 10 or even 20 years? Choose index funds that stand the test of time and continue to deliver strong returns over the long haul, and you'll most likely have a positive return towards the future. Now, when you look at FSKAX, you will notice its 10-year past performance is 14.21%. And this holds up very similar to the S&P 500, which returned 14.7%, and that's a pretty good average every single year. Now, the next thing I look at is the fund's expense ratio. And the reason I always look at this is because an expense ratio measures how much you'll pay over the course of a year to own that specific index fund. Now, that expense ratio consists of money that pays for things like management of the fund, marketing, advertising, and any other cost associated with running that actual fund. And these are costs that I would pay through a reduction in the investment's rate of return. So let's say there's a small expense ratio and I earn, let's say, 10% a year that fee will come out of the 10%. So let's say instead of 10% and it's a half a percent fee, I'll actually be earning 9.5% every year on my return. Now, FSKAX's expense ratio is extremely small at 0.015. And the average expense ratio for all index funds is typically about 0.2%. That's a pretty low expense ratio. Now, this means if I was to break it down, every $10,000 invested, you will actually pay $20 in fees if you were to use the average expense ratio, which I know is still extremely low, but why pay for that when you can pay 0.015% and only pay about $1.50 for every 10K invested? Now, the next thing I look for in index funds is the turnover rate. And this is extremely important when buying funds that are not in your retirement account, like a 401k or a traditional Roth IRA. Now, this is because the rate indicates the number of times the stocks in a fund has turned over or been sold within a year. Now, a fund that sells a lot of stocks throughout the year has high asset turnover. And the result of this in an individual brokerage and not in a retirement account is that it accrues the most capital gains. Now, because they are sold within a year, they are considered short-term capital gains, meaning they are taxed at your ordinary income tax rate. Now, this alone can add up quickly, and you can unknowingly owe a lot of money during tax season, especially if you have your account set to reinvest your earnings. I mean, think about it. If you reinvest all your positions back in, you're not knowingly actually making a profit because nothing is being taken out. But every single time that index fund or high turnover rate asset decides to sell its positions, you're being taxed on it, and you're going to get a bill as a 1099R at the end of the year from whatever brokerage you use, and you have to be the one to pay the taxes on it. Now, it's crucial to remember that even though you personally, and this is what I mean, didn't sell the index fund yourself, the fund itself within it is buying and selling stocks throughout the year, which you are responsible for paying for. And this is also why when investing out of retirement, it's best to invest in funds that employ a buy and hold strategy, as they are generally more tax efficient because they generate income that is taxable at lower capital gains rates. And that's also why I mentioned my quote from earlier earlier today, which is not about timing the market, but how much time you've been in the market, which is usually the best approach towards investing into the stock market. Now, although paying tax on index funds might not sound like much, long-term capital gains is typically about 15% but short-term capital gains, which is what you'd be accruing, can cost over 30% in some cases, and that's more than double. Now, FSKAX's turnover rate is extremely low at only 2%, and a rule of thumb is if an index fund has a high turnover rate, it usually means it's not being properly managed, and anything over 20 and even 30% should be viewed with skepticism or concern, and we'll talk about a few examples of this a little bit later. Now, with these tools in mind, let's look at the next index fund I invest in. My second pick is the Fidelity 500 Index fund with the ticker FXAIX. Now their strategy consists very similar at investing at least 80% of assets in common stocks included in the S&P 500 index. Now this broadly represents the performance of common stocks publicly traded in the US. Now the goal of this fund is to provide investment results that correspond to the total return and performance of common stocks publicly traded in the US. And over the past 10 years, this index fund has had an average annual return of 14.62%, which is almost identical to the S&P 500, 
which returned 14.7%. Now this index fund also has an expense ratio of 0.15 and a turnover rate of only 2%. Now sometimes funds like the two I mentioned have the same holdings, and if you invest in two index funds that mimic the same index or have the same holdings, you do increase the risk you're taking on. Now if the stock market begins to theoretically decline like we're seeing, both of your funds will lose value at the same time. They're not gonna be independent. So if you hold multiple index funds that invest in the same types of stocks and bonds, you're not really going to be increasing the diversification of your investments. So it's really important to make sure that you're diversifying properly. Just because the indexes have different names doesn't necessarily mean that you're buying different funds. So it's definitely a good idea to look at what they're actually each individually holding. Now, my third pick is the Fidelity Mid-Cap Index Fund. And the goal of this is to provide investment results that correspond to the total return of stocks of mid-cap U.S. companies. Now, their strategy consists of normally investing at least 80% of assets in securities included in the Russell Mid-Cap Index, which is similar to the S&P Index. Now, FSMDX's average annual return over 10 years has been 12.83% every single year compared to the Russell Mid-Cap Index, which has only earned 12.09% over the past 10 years. Now, their expense ratio is only 0.025%, and their turnover rate is 17%, which is still below average. And moving on, my fourth index fund is called Fidelity Small Cap Index Fund with the ticker FSSNX. Now, the objective of this fund is to provide investment results that correspond to the total return of stocks of small cap U.S. companies by normally investing at least 80% of assets into securities included in the Russell 2000 Index. Now, their 10-year APY is 11.2%, and this fund is similar to the Russell 2000, which is a market index comprised of 2,000 small cap companies and also has a 10% APY of 10.06%. So we're still beating it with our index. Now, also something to keep in mind is FSSNX's turnover rate is 34%, which is quite high compared to the others. But if you break it down and you think about it, small cap businesses tend to fluctuate quite a lot. A lot enter that 2000 index and a lot leave that 2000 index a lot faster than major blue chip companies, which have billions and billions of dollars and they usually stay stable. So that's why you see a lot more turnover because of the entry and exit that happen within an index like this. Now, the last index fund is called the Fidelity Inflation Protected Bond Index Fund. Now, I don't personally have this in my portfolio yet, and there is a reason behind it. Now, typically bonds are considered a defensive asset class because they are typically less volatile than some other asset classes such as stocks. And many investors and advisors include bonds in their portfolio as a source of diversification to help reduce volatility and overall portfolio risk. And since I'm only 24 and have many years left in investing, I usually take a slightly aggressive approach towards my portfolio in regards to an index fund and mutual fund standpoint. But this is why you don't see any international funds as well, because they don't really perform as good as the S&P 500 index funds. However, as I get older, my risk level towards my portfolio will change and I will start to become more conservative to reduce the impact of any major market swings. Now, usually the more conservative you are, the closer you are to retirement and the more bonds you would typically hold. And this is a way to actually minimize your loss when the market actually does drop. Now, the rule of thumb advisors have traditionally urged investors to use is in terms of the percentage of stocks an investor should have in their portfolio. Now, take, for example, a 30-year-old would typically hold 70% in stocks and 30% in bonds, and you can see the risk level there. However, a 60-year-old would typically have 40% in stocks and 60% in bonds and have a much more conservative approach. Now, the Fidelity Inflation Bond Index, known as FIPDX is used to protect from the negative impacts of inflation, which we're all currently experiencing from considering gas prices are at an all-time high, groceries have shot up in price, the used car market is exploding, and we're even seeing inflation over 8.5%. Now, these bonds increase payments when the inflation rises, and they decrease payments when the inflation falls. At maturity, the principal repayment is either an inflation-adjusted principal or the original principal or whichever is greater. Otherwise, guys, that about wraps up today's video, and and the index funds I currently am invested in to make myself a millionaire in the very near future. Now, you might have noticed that they are all on Fidelity, and Fidelity isn't the only brokerage
brokerage that has good index funds. Some of you may have heard of Vanguard and Vanguard also offers some really good ones as well. Now, the only reason I use Fidelity over Vanguard is because Vanguard typically charges a transaction fee online when purchasing funds. Now, not sure if that's only through Fidelity because that's what I saw, but it is one of the reasons I don't use them. And I'm not sure if they don't charge a transaction fee on uh, their own Vanguard brokerage. But also consider the other con to Vanguard is that they typically have a minimum investment amount that you must deposit on like Fidelity. So Fidelity, you can put in 500 bucks into an index fund, but Vanguard might say that the minimum deposit could be 2,500 or even $5,000, whatever they decide to choose. So guys, if you have any questions or comments, make sure to drop them down in the comment section below and make sure to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm, turn on post notifications, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in tomorrow's episode.